Welcome to Advanced Concepts. We are going to do an anatomy and physiology review of the endocrine system. The control of cellular function by any hormone depends on a series of reactions working through negative feedback control mechanisms. So when we talk about negative feedback control, um, hormone secretion usually depends on the need of the body for the final action of that hormone. So when a body condition starts to move away from the normal range and a specific action or response is needed to correct this change, typically secretion of the hormone capable of starting the correction action or response is stimulated until that need or that demand is met and the body condition returns to normal. So when you think about that, think about um, think about diabetes, think about when that blood glucose elevates, the body knows that it needs to produce insulin. Obviously with diabetes type 1, uh, the, the person's body can't produce insulin, so therefore they give themselves insulin injections. But in the normal person, when you think about how blood glucose is controlled, with that elevating blood glucose then, the body realizes that, oh, hey, my blood glucose is too high, so I need to start producing some insulin to bring that blood glucose down. Once that blood glucose level comes down, then the body realizes, okay, I've produced enough insulin, now it's time to back off production. Obviously, there's always a basal rate, but once that blood glucose starts to come down, then the body realizes that um, it can go ahead and stop the production. You could also think of this in the same instance of um, if you have a furnace in your house, the furnace kicks on when the heat is too when it when it gets too cool. So then the furnace kicks on, warms up the house, and then once the house is that at that say temperature of 72 degrees, then the furnace shuts off, and then over time the temperature is going to go down, and then the furnace realizes you know by mechanisms through um, electronics that hey the rooms are getting too cold and I need to kick back on so kind of working um, in that same manner if you want to think about it more technically um, an example of complex control is the interaction of the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary with the adrenal with the adrenal adrenal cortex um, low blood levels of cortisol from the adrenal cortex will stimulate secretion of corticotropic releasing hormone in the hypothalamus and then that cortisol releasing hormone stimulates the anterior pituitary to secrete adrenal cortotropic hormone or ACTH. Um, ACTH then triggers the release of cortisol from the adrenal cortex. Uh, the rising blood levels of cortisol inhibit CRH release from the hypothalamus. So without CRH the anterior pituitary gland stops secretion of ACTH um, in response, normal blood cortisol levels are then maintained. So if you want to think about it more complexly, this is also a slide in your book and um, talks a little bit in a more complex manner. So with the anatomy and physiology review, we're going to talk about these specific glands. We're going to, uh, and um, each slide that follows will represent the things that we're going to discuss. So with your hypothalamus, the hypothalamus is a small area of nerve and glandular tissue. It's located beneath the thalamus in the brain. Uh, the hypothalamus shares a small closed circulatory system with the anterior pituitary gland known as the hypothalamic hypopathial portal system. Um, this system allows hormones produced in the hypothalamus to travel directly to the anterior pituitary gland so that only very small amounts are wasted in systemic circulation. So the endocrine function of the hypothalamus is to produce regulatory hormones and these regulatory hormones will either stimulate or inhibit the release of anterior pituitary hormones. So the pituitary, when you move on and start talking about the pituitary gland, um, then the pituitary is divided into an anterior and posterior lobes. The anterior lobe secretes tropic hormones, which help stimulate other endocrine glands. So when you think about that, think about like prolactin and how when we produce prolactin, then the mother is able to lactate. The posterior pituitary is responsible for vasopressin, antidiuretic hormone, and oxytocin. And these are produced in the hypothalamus and sent through nerve tracts that connect the hypothalamus with the posterior pituitary. So those hormones have an end result of with antidiuretic, it's going to help um, retain fluid. Oxytocin is going to in, in 
start labor in a in a pregnant woman. Um, also things to consider um, the adrenal glands um, and with the adrenal glands you have um, it's they sit on top of each kidney and have an outer cortex and an inner medulla with the adrenal cortex that helps control the body's sodium and potassium content the mineral corticoids that are produced in the adrenal cortex help control body fluids and electrolytes. So aldosterone is the major mineral corticoid and it helps to maintain extracellular fluid volume. It promotes sodium and water reabsorption and potassium secretion in the kidney tubules. With the corticosteroids, um, Cortisol is the major one, and the main so the main glucocorticoid is cortisol, and cortisol affects carbohydrate, protein, and fat metabolism. It works with the body's response to stress, emotional stability, and also immune functioning. The adrenal medulla is a sympathetic nerve ganglion that secretes um, secretory cells. And so when you think about the adrenal medulla, remember your catecholamines, your norepinephrine and epinephrine, and activation of the sympathetic nervous system, which is how the body responds to stress. So it triggers that fight or flight response um, during heightened physical and emotional um, awareness or needs. The thyroid gland is something that we're going to focus on. Um, the thyroid gland is in the anterior neck, directly below the coracoid cartilage. And the cricoid cartilage is what we're looking for when um, we're doing intubation. So the thyroid gland helps control metabolism. Um, both hormones increase metabolism, which causes an increase in our oxygen consumption as well as heat production. And this is going to be really important when we start talking about hyper and hypothyroidism. Um, most circulating T4 and T3 are bound to plasma proteins. Um, the free hormone moves into, into the cell where it binds to its receptor in the cell nucleus. So once, that, once they're in the cell, the T4 is converted to T3, um, the most active thyroid hormone. So when you're looking at T3 and T4, it is controlled by the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid gland axis. Or, and again, it goes back to that negative feedback uh, mechanism. Calcium and phosphorus balance occur um, through the actions of calcitonin, and calcitonin lowers serum calcium and serum phosphorus levels by reducing bone reabsorption, resorption, or bone breakdown. And it really, in the thyroid gland, it works. The, the actions are opposite of the parathyroid hormone. So when we're talking about calcium and phosphorus balance in reference to the thyroid gland. It lowers the serum levels, so it's going to um, pull more calcium back into the bones. When you are looking at the parathyroid um, on the other spectrum, the parathyroid consists of four small glands that are located close to or within the body surface of the thyroid gland. And this, the parathyroid regulates calcium and phosphorus by acting on bones, the kidneys, and the GI tract. And then lastly, we want to talk about the pancreas. Pancreas lies behind the stomach and has exocrine and endocrine functions. The exocrine function of the pancreas um, involves the secretion of digestive enzymes through ducts that empty into the duodenum. And then the endocrine functions are reliant upon the cells inside the islets of Langerhans. And those are specific cells. So you have your alpha cell which secrete glucagon. You have your beta cell, which secretes insulin. And your delta cells, which secrete somatosin. I'm sorry, somatostatin. Um, glucagon and insulin affect carbohydrate, protein, and fat metabolism. And the somatostatin, which is secreted not only in the pancreas, but also in the intestinal tract and brain, inhibits the release of glucagon and insulin from the pancreas. So the delta cells are kind of, you know, work to keep a check and balance as far as alpha and, and beta cells go. Um, and we know that when you're thinking about your brain and you're thinking about glucose, our, our brain requires at least um, 60 a 60 milligram per deciliter when it 
in order to function properly. So we need a constant supply of glucose to feed our brain. If we don't have that constant supply, then we start seeing altered level of conscious changes. So that's why um, sometimes you get fatigued if you're not eating and you don't feel well if you're not eating. Um, so that's the importance behind that. Glucagon is a hormone that increases blood glucose levels. So it's triggered by decreased blood glucose levels and increased blood amino acid level levels. So glucagon, just remember, is a hormone. And insulin promotes the movement and storage of carbohydrates, protein, and fat. Insulin works to lower blood glucose levels by enhancing glucose movement across cell membranes and into the cells of many tissues. So when you're thinking about insulin and glucose, think about it as a lock and key type mechanism. And the glucose is the key that unlocks the cell in order to let the, in, let the glucose pass through and enter the cell. A few things that um, we see associated with aging, um, the effects of aging on the endocrine system are going to vary widely. It's going to vary from person to person. Um, they typically have reduced function, especially in the gonads, so that would be testicles and ovaries in women. We see a decrease in thyroid glands. We do see increased incidence of hypothyroidism in, in the elderly and then the pancreas. So that's why sometimes we're seeing um, a lot of the elderly develop type 2 diabetes. However, we also are seeing a huge influx of adolescents with type 2 diabetes in the United States um, due to obesity things like that. Um, so it's difficult to, to distinguish normal from abnormal endocrine activity. When um, people get older, simply because, you know, do they have any other comorbidities? So are there any other acute or chronic illnesses that they have that are going to affect endocrine function? Alterations in the diet. We know that um, elderly sometimes tend to eat less. Their activity level is decreasing if they have um, difficulty with mobility. Um, we also see disturbances in sleep patterns, decreased metabolic clearance rate of hormones, and since they uh, maybe have other comorbidities, they do have an increased incidence of multiple drugs, so that polypharmacy, and that can affect hormone function. So when you are assessing elderly patients, just remember to consider these factors. Um, encourage the older adult to participate in regular screenings, good exercise, um, and healthy lifestyle changes. We will meet in class on the first day and on the first day we will start talking about assessment of um, the endocrine system. So when you come be ready to talk about assessment metho methods that we will be utilized um, during the concept of metabolism. If you have any questions please don't hesitate to email, bring them to class, and we will talk about them and hopefully make everything clear rather than cloudy. Thank you.